Thanks for considering my application to Courant for a mathematics PhD. I chose Courant first and foremost because I'd like to dive into math as deeply as possible, and this program has an excellent reputation for the depth and significance of its research. Additionally though, I'm not yet 100% confident about where exactly I'd like to specialize in math, and feel that this program is strong enough to enable almost any research direction, and supportive enough to empower me to make this decision confidently. Finally, I'd certainly plan on pursuing exciting applications of math over the summers, as I've done for the last few non-pandemic ones, and would be very grateful for the help afforded to students in this pursuit. My long-term objective is to enter a career in academia. The only thing I love more than learning is teaching, which has consistently given me the most engaging and meaningful conversations I've had as an undergraduate, and because I truly love discussing math so much, I'm going to go ahead and skip to that. So for the rest of this video, I'm going to do the closest thing I can to a Blackboard presentation under quarantine in my dorm and talk about Cantor's diagonalization argument, which is maybe a bit simple, but it's my favorite proof ever, and as an added benefit, I've explained it to students, friends, and family like a million times. So the reason I like this so much is you don't need any math terminology at all to explain it, and it's still totally rigorous, or at least close enough that I can say it's totally rigorous and not feel like I'm lying too much. So what we want to show is for any collection of things, even an infinite one, there's another collection of things that's strictly bigger. First, we have to decide what it means for one collection of things to be strictly bigger than another, since the most obvious answer of count them and compare the totals is just not going to work in the infinite case. So to motivate this, I usually tell students they're locked in a room with two piles of something on the order of 10,000 marbles and absolutely no other resources, and they have to tell me which pile's bigger, and it's just too hard to keep track of the total in their head. So sooner or later, most students will think of something like, pull one marble from each pile simultaneously, and keep going until one runs out, and that's the smaller pile. At this point, it should be pretty intuitive that two collections of things are the same size if we can associate each item from one collection with a unique item from the other collection in such a way that they're paired up perfectly one-to-one. -one. So now I like to say there's an invading army coming, and you're in charge of preparing a defending army and you'd like to ensure your army is strictly bigger, meaning if the invading army sends each of their soldiers to attack one of your soldiers, you'll always have extra soldiers left over. So how can you do this? One idea is, for each of their soldiers, just hire two soldiers. So if the attacking army is Al, Bob, and Carl, then you'll have Al, Al Prime, Bob, Bob Prime, Carl, and Carl Prime. And regardless of the attacking army's battle plan, you'll always have at least three soldiers left over. But if the attacking army is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, then hiring an army of 0, 0 Prime, 1, 1 Prime, 2, 2 Prime, and so on, is actually not going to work because the attacking general can just tell each of their soldiers to divide their number by 2 and write prime instead of 0.5, and this is a way to pair up both armies perfectly evenly, so you actually don't have any more soldiers than the attackers do. So we need something that works even in the infinite case, and the answer is to hire a soldier for every subset of the attacking army's soldiers. If the attacking army is Al, Bob, and Carl, then you'll hire Al, Bob, Carl, Al, Bob, Al, Carl, Bob, Carl, and Al, Bob, Carl and another soldier named Nil that represents the subset of none of the attacking army's soldiers. Now, when they organize their battle plan, you need to prove there's always going to be one of your soldiers left over. If their battle plan is to send Al to attack Bob Carl, Bob to attack Al Bob Carl, and Carl to attack your Al, then you want to pick one of your soldiers that isn't being attacked by any of theirs. Notice Al is attacking a soldier whose name does not include Al, so if you make sure the soldier you pick has a name including Al, then you ensure he's not being attacked by Al. Bob is attacking a soldier whose name does include Bob. So if the soldier you pick has a name not including Bob, you ensure he's not being attacked by Bob. And finally, Carl is attacking a soldier whose name does not include Carl. So if the soldier you pick has a name including Carl, you ensure he's not being attacked by Carl. So this algorithm produces a soldier, uh, in this case Al Carl, who's not being attacked by any of the enemy's soldiers, and it works even in the infinite case. Thus, for any collection of things, there's a strictly bigger collection of things, and I like to summarize with a philosophical comment that there are in fact infinitely many levels of infinity, which I think is pretty cool.